Oh. My. F Ozark Season 4, sorry, scratch that. Half of Ozark Season 4 is here. But I don't care if we're only getting half. Prolong the inevitable. Put this show on life support and keep it the f*** alive. Because I'm freaking over the moon right now. Because today, I'm going to be talking about the ending of Ozark Season 4 Part 1. As well as giving a full in-depth analysis of the entire season. Because I'm feeling dangerous. And by the way, if you want a quick refresher of the previous seasons, I made this same kind of video for Seasons 1, 2, and 3. They're pretty cool. Link in the description below. But let's get into analyzing season four already. Oh, and by the way, spoilers. So just a quick recap. Wendy's brother Ben fell in love with Ruth, but he couldn't make love to Ruth if he was on his meds. So he decided not to take them. But if Ben stops taking his meds, he becomes a little... <laughs> So because of this, Ben freaked out and told Helen's daughter that her mom is the lawyer for a really big drug cartel, a story that was later confirmed by Charlotte and Jonah. Ben revealing this information to Helen's daughter is a big no-no. Even after Wendy had been killed, Helen was still out for blood. Navarro, this baddie, was in the middle of a war and he was losing, so he was wanting to leave behind a legitimate fortune for his kids, if he ended up losing the war, which was most likely going to happen. Helen tried to become a signatory in Bird Enterprises, and persuaded Charles to expedite the casino license by offering him the opportunity to secure his hotel and shopping center. That way, Helen could secure and operate Navarro's legitimate assets, causing no need to keep Wendy and Marty around. Wendy and Marty's security was tied to Navarro, so Wendy tried to show that her and Marty were loyal to Navarro by telling him that they had been killed, but Navarro simply responded with, You did what was required. Don't act like I should be grateful. Telling Wendy and Marty that they were going to have to think of a different plan to save their lives, Maya claimed that if a drug cartel commits violence on U.S. soil, the government sends troops in response. Jonah took a video of the Laguna's cartel attacking the Cosgrove men, giving the birds more than enough evidence to present the FBI so that they can push the U.S. military to intervene against the Laguna's cartel. Helen secured Navarro's contingency plan for losing, while Marty and Wendy gave him a path to victory. So when it came to deciding between Helen or or the birds, the choice was pretty obvious. Also, during that same phone call where Wendy told Navarro about Ben, Navarro claimed, so What do you expect from me, Wendy? Huh? Do you want me to throw my arms around you, hold you close to my heart? Like your blood is my blood. And then we end season three with this shot. Always thought that was a nice touch. The birds also having enough pull with the FBI is why Navarro chose Wendy and Marty. The Laguna's cartel was virtually defeated with US military intervention. So Navarro's concern then shifts from an external threat to an internal one, as he has a nephew, Javi Alessandro, who is now wanting to kill him and take over the family business. You know, normal nephew stuff. So Navarro now wants to cut a deal with the FBI, so he can be granted immunity and freely travel between the states and Mexico. Navarro appoints Javi to become the successor and take over the cartel. This way Navarro could give up his nephew while presenting the FBI with enough information to neutralize the entire cartel. However, the FBI wanted Navarro to stay on as head of the cartel for the next five years. Rather than taking down an entire cartel, they were wanting to establish a relationship between them and Navarro, so that Omar could provide the FBI with intelligence for half a decade. After five years, then the FBI could grant Navarro with immunity. Agent Maya Miller, who is wanting to eradicate this cartel, is completely blindsided by her superiors, as they went over her head to establish a new deal with Navarro that involves keeping the cartel alive and well. So as an act of retaliation, Maya takes the opportunity to arrest Navarro at the airport, using what looks like local police. The news and media coverage alone is enough to sabotage the secret plan of Maya's superiors. Maya was able to pull off this arrest because Omar Navarro was on U.S. soil, obviously, and no one else knew about the FBI's agreement because it was completely off the books. So they can't just fire Maya for arresting one of the most wanted leaders of a drug cartel. Maya complicated things. So Marty and Wendy had to come up with a new plan to save their entire family. Again, that plan involves Navarro telling Javi that he was working with the FBI, and convincing Javi to take the same deal that Navarro was going to take. That way, the FBI would arrest Javi and extradite Navarro back to Mexico. The FBI turns the deal with Javi into 10 years. 
allowing him absolute freedom when running the cartel in Mexico as long as he meets the fiscal stipulation they agreed on, meaning the FBI would be taking 10 more years worth of money seizures so that they could get more funding and credibility. Basically, you know, rigging the entire system. Navarro is disappointed in the birds because even though Navarro doesn't have to face trial, Javi gets the deal with the FBI and the cartel. With Navarro uh, a little upset, the birds still manage to protect themselves from Navarro by claiming that if anything happens to them, Navarro's children will lose all of their money and any legitimate capital. Then on top of all of that, they threaten Navarro with letting Javi know that Navarro gave up his nephew and the entire cartel to the FBI. Because if Javi knows about Navarro's betrayal, Javi will kill Navarro and definitely his kids as well. This is why Navarro makes it known to Wendy and Marty that he would never threaten to kill their kids, making it so that a cartel boss seems more morally sane than the birds. One thing I really want to analyze is how they started season 4. In the episode The Beginning of the End, we open with a scene that involves the bird family getting into what looks like a fatal car accident. Before the crash, the birds have a conversation where Wendy claims that in just 48 hours, uh, something's gonna happen, implying that they're finally on their way back to Chicago. Then she looks at Jonah and tells him that he doesn't have to come if he doesn't want to, telling us that Wendy has eased back on trying to mercilessly control Jonah, giving him a choice rather than forcing him to be a part of the family by getting him arrested and so on. So it looks like the feud between the two of them has de-escalated. But clearly, not all is forgiven between the two of them, because there is still this awkward tension in the van that's almost as awkward as the dinner with Javi. Given the context, this opening car accident is most likely a future event rather than a dream, like the one Wendy had about Marty in Season 3. In order to better understand what's going on with this accident at the beginning of Season 4, and why we are seeing this future event at the beginning of the season, we gots to go back to the beginning, like all the way back to Season 1, aka the year 2007, when Marty and Wendy were raising their family in the suburbs of Chicago. After working on the Obama campaign for a state senate race, Wendy left politics to focus on her family. Marty was still working as an incredibly talented accountant at his firm, with his business partner Bruce. Then one day, Dell waltzes into Marty's office looking for a new accountant. Marty is able to spot Dell's previous accountant, Lewis, skimming money from the cartel during this audit. Dell was impressed, but Marty declined to take on Dell as a client because of Dell's affiliation with, um, crime. During this time, Wendy was pregnant, but during her pregnancy, Wendy and Marty got in a car accident. You know, just like... You see the parallels already? You get it? So it looks like they're doing what they did in the episode Kaleidoscope, but for the entirety of Season 4, where we open on a car accident that will greatly determine the future. So when we are presented with the context behind this car accident, I'm interested to see how this event will affect the future of the birds. Because after accident number one, Wendy was hospitalized and lost the child she was carrying. After Wendy failed to get back into politics and lost her kid, she hit a massive low point in her life. Dell, still impressed by Marty's capabilities, invites him and Bruce to one of his resorts. So Marty thought it would be a good idea for him and Wendy to go on a little vacation, where Marty accepts Dell's offer. Before the accident, the song That'll Be The Day by Buddy Holly plays in the car. This song is used as an example to prove Marty's point of how one decision can drastically affect the future. Then, in the beginning of the end, the birds listen to the song Bring It Home To Me by Sam Cooke, a song about a singer losing someone he loved and wanting them to return to him. This could be representative of the birds returning to their home in Chicago, or the marriage between Wendy and Marty finally becoming whole, or as whole as it can be again. Getting in an accident is the event that pushed them to enter the cartel, so it's poetic that they get in another accident as they're exiting the cartel world. Once he agreed to work for Dell, Marty witnessed the death of Lewis after unknowingly taking his place. When Marty saw Dell's previous partner get killed, that changed him. In that moment, Marty fully understood the severity of what he signed up for, and what he got his family involved with. In the flashbacks with him and Wendy, Marty appears to be full of life. When you compare that to how he is after partnering with Dell, Marty is completely dead inside. He worked non-stop for Dell in order to assure that his family would be safe. But at the same time, he emotionally distanced himself from Wendy and the kids. This is what caused Wendy to become unhappy and push her to have an affair with Gary, as she became desperate for affection and intimacy. In Season 1 Episode 7, Nest Box, Wendy accuses Marty of shutting her out the 
moment they decided to launder money. We've always known Marty to be irritatingly frugal and strict with money, but in Season 4, Episode 7, Sanctified, we see flashbacks of the events before Dell killed Bruce and their business partners. They show Marty and Bruce debating getting the new office, and then they reveal that Marty, even though he's frugal AF, decided to take the new office before everything went down. During their conversation in the new office, Bruce asks Marty when was the last time he felt truly happy. Then later in the episode, we see this moment where Marty reflects on him, his kids, and Wendy on a trampoline. So it's no coincidence that in Sanctified, when Marty is getting the new office in Chicago, he walks over to that same trampoline, the symbol of him finally being reunited with his family, all of this telling us that he's finally getting his life back. When Marty and Wendy are telling Charlotte that they can all go back to Chicago, it was the first time Marty reminded me of how he was before signing on to the cartel. A fair amount of people got really mad at Charlotte during season 2. Because she was supposedly being annoying, she got a van, would spend most of her nights getting high, and wanted to get emancipated. To be fair, getting emancipated was the worst part because she got a lawyer involved, because this gave Marty and Wendy a whole nother mess to deal with on top of already having to get the casino off the ground so they can, you know, uh, save their family from dying. Those who are mad at Charlotte for doing this really inconvenient and quote unquote annoying behavior tend to forget that Marty and Wendy do a terrible job at being transparent with each other and with their kids. Charlotte had barely any idea about the specifics of their situation, because Marty and Wendy operate under the assumption that the truth is just too much for their kids. Yet the lies and dishonesty is what is driving their kids further away, and further complicating the entire situation. This would all end up putting the birds even more at risk. An absolute prime example of this would be in Season 1, Episode 2, Blue Cat, where Marty didn't inform his kids that there was $8 million hidden under the bed. Instead, he left it there and told Jonah and Charlotte to stay in the hotel room. But the kids left and the money got stolen. However, in Charlotte's defense, she didn't know about the $8 million. All teenagers are naturally rebellious at some point, and that's who she is, a normal teenager. If your parents roped you into a bad situation where they were laundering money for a drug cartel, thus putting your life in constant jeopardy, you would definitely prefer more communicative parents. And when they don't inform you on anything while trying to enforce the more traditional rules and morals onto you, chances are you'd be pretty upset and would want to get out of that situation as soon as possible. It's also important to note that Charlotte was the one who made the decision to go back to the Ozarks at the end of season one so the family could be whole again. It's only when Marty and Wendy's marriage started falling apart and the lies and deception continued that Charlotte decided to leave. But at the end of season three, Charlotte tells Jonah, But none of this works if we don't stick together. Which is true. If it wasn't for Jonah's footage combined with Charlotte intervening in Marty and Wendy's brainstorming session, the birds would be dead. And in seasons 3 and 4, Charlotte shows us that she's an adult now. The biggest indicator of this being how she went from not listening to her parents when left alone at the Lazio, which allowed Ruth to steal from the birds, to her parents now leaving her alone with the entire casino, where she is now kicking Ruth out of the office when trying to steal from the birds again. But my biggest concern for her character is how she's becoming just like Wendy. But I am simply bringing up Charlotte's character arc because Jonah is now exhibiting the same kind of behavior that Charlotte annoyed everyone with during the first half of the series. So now that everyone is saying the same kind of stuff about Jonah, as he's become the rebellious rage against the Wendy kind of teenager, I will just use the same Charlotte defense of He's a teenager, especially because the animosity towards their parents in both cases is incredibly justified. Marty and Wendy become the biggest hypocrites when they claim that everything they do is to protect their family, yet Wendy goes off and sacrifices her own brother to the cartel. But I'm not a madman. I can understand why people have their frustrations with Jonah, especially when it comes to him just casually giving away sensitive information to get at Wendy, without understanding that every time he runs his mouth like that, he's putting not just Wendy, but his entire family, including himself, at risk. And I think Charlotte really knocked some sense into him when she said, They're not up to date on the inner workings of our family, Jonah, and they will kill you. But wait, you know what? Actually, scratch that. He's learned nothing from those words. Telling Ruth who Javi is was probably the dumbest thing Jonah could have done. Wendy and Marty's new plan to live in Chicago again, and just to stay alive in general, now depends on Javi staying alive as well. If Rampage Mode Ruth executes the creep, then the birds are as good as dead. 
instead. Because if Javi is out of the picture, Navarro gains back his leverage and will go after Marty and Wendy who screwed him over. In season 3 after Ben dies, Jonah goes after Helen, but decides not to kill her after their conversation. Jonah later discovers Ben's ashes at the house, which then pushes Jonah to pump up the shotgun and shoot a window. Let's talk about why Jonah does this. In season 1 episode 5, Ruling Days, Buddy shows Jonah how to fire a weapon. Later in the episode, Ash breaks into the bird's house, and Jonah takes out his gun, but decides to put it away and get in his mother's car. In season 1 episode 10, The Toll, when Garcia enters the bird's house to stop them from leaving, Jonah was the one with a weapon. Little did he know, Buddy found out where Jonah was stashing the gun and removed the bullets. Buddy did this because he was either concerned for Jonah's safety, or he was not wanting him to get involved with the criminal activity that his family is notorious for. Or both. Buddy having ties with Frank Cosgrove and the Kansas City mob implies that he knows a thing or two about crime. When it came down to taking Garcia's life, Jonah needed Wendy's approval to pull the trigger. But because Buddy removed the bullets, the gun didn't go off. Instead, Buddy was the one to shoot Garcia and save the birds. When Buddy shoots Garcia, the window behind him shatters. This is an important detail, so definitely make note of that. In Season 2, Episode 3, Once a Langmore, Jonah embarks into the woods with the Snells during the first day of hunting season. They spot a deer, and Jacob Snell gives the first kill to Jonah. Jonah accurately fires his weapon, kills the deer, and is later given a taxidermied head of it. Jonah later discards of this head, almost like he's rejecting this path of violence. We then see Jonah focus on things like Mike Flem's money laundering accounts, uh, shell companies, and flying drones. However, when he's made fun of by Tommy with Aaron present, he fires Tommy's gun to shoot all three bottles in a very precise manner. Ben dies, and Jonah goes after Helen. But during their conversation, Helen tells Jonah that Wendy was the one who okayed Ben's death. Jonah then finding Ben's ashes in the house confirms the legitimacy of Helen's story. So Jonah angrily pumps up his shotgun and fires it through the window, mirroring this shot where Buddy fires his weapon to kill Garcia. So I thought it would be Jonah threatening Wendy with a shotgun in front of the same window rather than Ruth doing it to Marty. But regardless, Jonah shot out not just that window, but a bunch of other ones, signifying that he's willing to step up and cross that line of taking a life. And this time it won't just be because someone okayed it. And I don't think it's too late in the series for Jonah to be crossing this line that his parents already crossed. Ruth is in a very, very interesting position. She was a business partner of Darlene, and the most immediate family to Wyatt. Which matters because Wyatt and Darlene sealed the deal on their marriage before their deaths. Meaning Ruth could seize this opportunity to take over the Snell's operation. The same way Frank Jr. took over the KC mob. Another detail that I thought was important was how during the opening scene in the beginning of the end, Zeke is luckily not present in the car. When Ruth goes full rampage mode, she drives away in the car with Zeke. It's possible that in the future, Ruth is going to be looking after Zeke. In fact, Zeke's presence in that car is the one thing that's probably going to calm down Ruth and prevent her from going after Javi. Here's the thing, Wendy is as power hungry as Darlene. It's just harder to see because she doesn't have the I'm gonna end your life eyes. Oh wait, Never mind. And Darlene also has the capability to shoot her enemies herself, rather than having hired guns do her dirty work for her. Quick side note, for anyone who thought Darlene just shotgunning people was a little bit too much this season, I mean, did you forget how Dell became no longer alive at the end of season one? Darlene was always going to be unstable, as she acted more on emotion rather than logic this entire series. And with Jacob Snell, aka the most rational person in her life out of the picture, there was no longer anyone to hold Darlene Darlene back. So it actually makes sense how the one person to take out Darlene is someone who's as unstable, if not more unstable, than her. And for that reason, Javi scares me more than any other villain in the show. Well that, paired with the fact that he's now working with the FBI, and is now the leader of the second largest drug cartel in Mexico. At the end of part one, Javi laughs at the billboard of the missing sheriff because he's well aware that he's now above the law. Anyway, whether she fully understands it or not, Wendy was never going to be content in Chicago, even if her and Marty's marriage didn't fall apart. Navarro was the one person to call out Wendy on her discontent for an average life, telling her to think of him when she's alone, when her kids are away at school and when her husband is at the office, telling her to remember how she had this power and excitement when she was working for Navarro, but Navarro's message completely goes over her head. I don't think anyone's gonna die in the van. I mean heck, Dell even said it himself. 
top ranked mini in the US. However, this may be the turning point that brings the birds back to the Ozarks. I don't know exactly how, but with Jacob Snell telling Marty, What do you do, Morton? When the bride that took your breath away becomes the wife, it makes you hold your breath in terror as well as the dream sequence with Wendy killing Marty, as well as Navarro starting the season telling Marty, Your greatest threat will always come from the inside, Marty. Never forget that. The final confrontation of Ozark may be between Marty and Wendy, but Wendy's flaw was letting her power trip get the best of her. When Darlene killed Dell, Jacob had to be the one to kill Ash to make everything right with the cartel, sharing huge parallels to how Wendy had to kill Ben to make everything right with the cartel. Jacob's defense was that Darlene was always undermined him. You know, the same issue Marty and Wendy have with each other. If anything, the Snells are just future Marty and Wendy. And we all know how that ended, so Wendy is definitely someone to be worried about in part 2. That was everything I had to say today about Ozark Season 4 Part 1. If you want a part 2 to my Ozark Season 4 Part 1 video, let me know in the comments. As always, thank you so much for watching, and I will see you in my next Ozark video.